Here we are. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Bucks Report. It's not really Blake and Blake Sports. It's more like Phil and Blake Sports right now. So if Peter wants to join or anybody else wants to join in, the link is up there. Hell, tonight I might even put the link down for the fans down there. Somebody jump in and tell us how they feel about the draft because I know for sure if I'm hurting, y'all is hurting. So, <laughs> so um, today I'm going to give you two parts. I'm going to give you two parts on how I really feel and how I uh, – how I understand where the picks are. So they, that's the fun part of being a, a sports guy. You got to have those two parts in you. And of course, I'm with my main man, Mr. Philip Swagler here. He's going to bring the flavor, the chef, where Phil flavor. Yeah, I guess so. You know, a little bit of hair spice. No, I'm just kidding. A little bit of hair spice, a little, gar- <laughs> little garnish and all that type of stuff. Alfalfa sprites and all uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, he's coming out of red, red flag podcast and Phil did a great interview with a, uh, Clifton Smith down there at Raymond James Stadium. Phil's looking real professional down there. He's hobnobbing it up with the <laughs> with the family and, and the old players. Chidi Ahana, too, was there. I was looking forward to seeing Clayton. I didn't see him there. That would have been fun uh, to get Phil yeah. to interview with him as well because I like Clayton because he's very – um uh, very emotional what he talks about and you actually yeah. believe what he's saying about it, it's sincere because that's how he really feels. And that's yeah. all I really want, just tell you how you feel, and that's what makes it fun doing this. You just – I mean, in 2019, you should be able to say how you feel about stuff and where you feel like that without everybody getting offended or PR friendly. You should you say how you feel. there's ways you can say stuff and be respectful about it. Um, uh, you can go ahead, Phil. Um, you you want to talk about a little anything in particular before we go into the draft picks? Uh, no, I mean, I, I mean, other than the draft part, like draft week weekend started out pretty well. I mean, we we're down there at Ray J. Uh, it was pretty popping when we got there. You know, there's a lot of people on the field. Kind of went through the locker room. There's a lot of people there taking pictures, having a good time. Went up to the West Club. It's where all, like, you know, the more uh, expensive people are, I guess you could say. <laughs> uh, you know, we got to talk to a couple of legends and, you know, just hang out. So draft weekend kind of kicked off real well for us and then started getting the picks in and, then, you know, it went from there. So, um, yeah, man, I'm just – let's just talk about the picks, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels right. It was it was a great time out there. There was a lot of legends there, uh, a lot of old-timers, a lot of oh, guys yeah. that didn't really get their careers off. Like uh, Maurice Stovall was here for a couple of years. We ran here around in Notre Dame. Um, you know, of course, Clifton Smith has always stayed in this area. And, there, and what's great is all those guys, even Clayton, stay in this area, and they work in the community. And they try to live off of Tony Dungy's uh, motto, you know, help out everybody in the community and try to do right and try to do it like a good deed for somebody else and somebody else later on will do that good deed for somebody. And what I mean by that is like, for example, is like what Warwick Dunn did for uh, Deshaun Jackson's mother out in Atlanta. And a lot of people don't know that. Well, Deshaun Jackson was a recipient, Deshaun Jackson, no, Deshaun Watson, (laughs) Watson was a recipient, his mother was a recipient of uh, Warwick Dunn buying a home for single mothers in Atlanta. And lo and behold, that produced Deshaun Deshaun Watson to go do the same thing for victims out in Houston when all that tragedy happened. And so that's why I said no good deed really goes undone. It just doesn't, sometimes it doesn't happen or flourish when you want it to. So, you know, that kind of stuff is cool when you always go back to the community. Um, So let's start from the top. Like I said, I was going to tell you how I feel. I'm going to tell you how I, I understand. <clears throat> All right. How I feel, I think it's a catastrophe. He said it straight up. Catastrophe. The draft. Okay. Th- this is the this is the fan. This is Blake, not Buccaneer Blake. No, this is Blake. This is a catastrophe. And I utterly wanted to turn it off when I saw the t- the second cornerback come on the field, and, and then I saw the safety come off. I said, "What? We, we reciprocated the same draft from 2018 almost, <laughs> uh, except this year we took a linebacker first. Uh, I, I, I don't. How did you feel about that, Phil? Um, I, I don't know. That second and third round just really kind of blew my mind. Uh, as far as picking defensive backs, like back to back to back like that. Um, I thought we got our guys, you know, in Carlton Davis, MJ Stewart, and uh, Jordan Whitehead. I thought we had that last season, and the new coaching staff was going to come in, and they were going to change them and make them better, and they're going to be these star players for us. And then we see the Buccaneers draft these three guys, you know, in that third, second round, and now we're just kind of confused. Correct. That was uh, bunting. Mm 
Oh, all right, there look like uh, oh, we lost Phil for a second. All right, he'll be right back. He was talking about bunting. He was talking. Oh, there he is. All right, let me get you back in here. All right, Go my ahead. back. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Connection bad. My bad. So yeah. No. Basically, all right, you know what you can really all you can really do right now is wait and see. You know what I mean? You really don't know what's going to happen with these guys that we saw just drafted um, this season until the actual season starts in September. So, I mean, you can cast your judgments now and all that good stuff and get mad about it, but until we actually see the product on the field and see if these guys can actually play together and win football games, we're really not going to know how this uh, NFL draft turned out this season. Absolutely. And, I, and, and that's the, and the way you said it. And like I said, I, I dislike the draft period. Um, this is a, this is basically a wait and see draft, and that's really not one of the fans wanted to see. You say you're in win now mode, but you had a lot of players that you passed on that could have put you yeah. in a win now mode situation. If I'm explaining that correctly or saying that correctly, uh, you passed on a lot of guys. A lot of these guys, if, if Carlton Davis, MJ, and um, Hargraves, and um, Carlton Davis are supposed to be the guys, you, you just basically reciprocated the same draft from last year, literally two corners and a safety is exactly what you did. Um, yeah. And then you picked another kicker in the fifth round. We're going to go through this trauma again. You just yeah. re-signed Kerry Santos <laughs> in the offseason. You're still paying um, the other kicker. Uh, what, 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 is Light literally trying to get fired? The, de- the, the defensive end and defensive tackle, I already know what that is. I'm going to get into that later. The safety was for depth. Um, but it, 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 it just blew my mind watching this draft. I, I told you, I was. I don't think I've ever been that upset in my life watching the draft as a Tampa, a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan and that draft that I just watched the past two, two, three days. I, I could not believe what I was watching, and I really hope that these players, I'm talking about beyond Devin White, um, mm-hmm. can develop into something. I mean, even Devin White, I know everybody was so big on the 40-yard dash time and everything, that, but my biggest argument was I didn't want him at five. I, w- I would rather have him later and acquire more picks yeah, in the second round where back. a lot of those studs went at the top of the second round. And that's where I told you, I told everybody at Bucks Report, I said, if you're going to win this draft, you got to find some, find some way to get two picks around that top 50 marker and get two st- solid studs that you need Um in the, in this draft and we can we let it pass right on by um by sticking with Devin White. If he really wanted to fix a, stick with a fast linebacker, he could have went with Devin Bush out of Michigan. He was just as fast. He's not as big as White, but he was just as fast and he's a rangy linebacker. He could have went with that and doubled up on picks and, and got a, a stud defensive tackle or a stud uh a defensive end. And and then the, lo and behold the, the the worst part of it all is that you let Josh Allen walk to the yeah. Jacksonville Jaguars. They could yeah. not believe that he was sitting there if i was in that draft room i would have fell out the back of my seat yeah and that no, josh allen it. was still sitting on there I, i'd have fell back with my hat feet flying up try to hit that draft button so fast that my fingers would have got burned trying to hit it so fast <laughs> <laughs> no i was i was sitting next to uh brent from Petercast when the pick went off i was doing a little bit of audio with him and i just kept saying all right awesome josh allen he's right there on the board that's what we're gonna get Buccaneers are sitting there. They're playing with, uh, you know, the time on the clock, how much time they have. And then, lo and behold, you know, we get Devin White. And I don't want to hate on Devin White because I, no, I do like Devin White. I like White. him. And, and, and it's a need on the team. I mean, look at who's starting behind Levante David. You no, have buddy. Levante Bond, which what has he done for the past few years? All right. You have uh, Jack Cincy. He's coming off the injury. You have um, – You lost oh Glanton. Yeah, and Glant. No, he lost Taylor, Glant. Or Taylor. Taylor. Or Taylor, yep. And then, you know, there's not really much more depth there. We don't know what's going on with Kendall Beckwith. You lost the heart, I would say, the heart and soul of that defense at Quan Alexander this offseason. And signing or getting a guy in the draft like Devin White, that's going to make that replacement if he can get onto that same level as far as his, I don't want to say raw, raw, but his leadership. And, you know, I'm going to do it first and you guys follow behind. I think that's kind of what the Buccaneers were trying to get on defense. They wanted their quarterback on the defense. And, you know, we got Jameis Winston on the offense. He's going to run that offense. You need a guy on defense that's going to hold them together and gel them together. And it kind of sucks that, you know, the 21 year old guy, first year in the league, and they're going to put that much pressure on him playing middle linebacker. But, I, you know, the team needs something different. They need to move in a different direction. They've been losing for too long. You got to start putting winners on this team. And I think it started with Devin White and the 2019 NFL draft. I agree. It, something needed to change. I mean, you could say Quan, Quan, Quan all day. <sighs> he, along with Gerald McCoy, have been on a losing culture franchise uh, for too long. And, and a lot of it's not their fault. And that's why I always, yeah. and I will continue 
to defend Gerald McCoy, we let him down. He didn't really mm-hmm. let the Buccaneers down. We let him down and not producing quality defensive line. I think somebody posted that we've only drafted two t- two defensive ends since 2015. Yeah, um, it was like three or four or something like yeah, that. But yeah. And where are they now? Um, that's besides the <laughs> fans. Um, uh, uh, th- I mean, I really hope that that Bowles' defense is as he says it is, and you can get to the pressure, and then I'll look back on this and say, okay, you got the secondary fix, and, and we can keep rolling, or maybe we can get some of these uh, older guys that they're probably going to cut within these next couple of days um, to sign rookies, and and because you got rookies to replace them and you want to move and get cap space and stuff like that, maybe we can fill it in somewhere or something like happens. But um, uh. I agree. Something needed to change. Devin White, hopefully, will be that guy. I hope they really use him. I said it before, if we take him at five, then I really hope that you're going to use him in some type of pass rushing situation yeah. here and not just sit back and, and, and play against the run because we really didn't have the issues against the run. I, I, yeah. Crazy enough that we weren't bad against the run. Now, the other part of that is you could throw on us and throw for 300 yards a game and you don't need to run the ball. So why? If something's not broke, don't fix it. So, I don't mean, fix it. <laughs> It's it was, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes. Basically, this is basically wait and see because none of these guys yeah. that's on here besides the kicker should come out and uh, you know be a starter for day one unless something crazy happens in the camp. Yeah, I mean, and the good thing about the kicker, I guess, if you want to call it a good thing, um, Cairo Santos, I guess, the only dead money that they would owe the Buccaneers would owe him is I think the hundred sixty five thousand dollars signing bonus. Don't quote me on that number. I know it's somewhere in that range. Compared to uh, Gay's uh, sign-on bonus, which would be three hundred thousand dollars. So, if he ends mm-hmm. up beating out Cairo Santos in training camp or whatever have you, the Bucks are only going to take that hundred sixty-five thousand dollar hit. And this guy, you know, he's a Lou Grouse right. Award winner. You know, just like Roberto Aguayo, and don't kill me about the Sounds Roberto Aguayo stuff right now. But um, you know, this familiar. guy was you know one of the, <laughs> one of the best kickers in college football. Um, and you know, the, oh, you start to look at what the Buccaneers. You start looking at what the Buccaneers did in the offseason. You know, they got rid of Brian Anger. Brian Anger was that, you know, that same guy that held the ball for all those kickers, for all the problems that the Buccaneers had with their kicking yep. game. So maybe this is a way that Jason Light, Bruce Arians are trying to get rid of the kicking curse that we've had in Tampa since Matt Bryant left and, you know, really starting to plug in fresh people, people who have never been in that organization who have no ties to the kicking curse. That's just a theory and that's some kind of crazy fan theory, but that's how I'm kind of thinking now. Um, oh, I apologize. And I said, I said, nobody should start since day one that the kicker, I mean, besides Devin White as well. Uh, yeah. that's without question. I figured, and I saw somebody say that he said, Who Devin White, then who's gonna start in front of Devin White? I figure I didn't have to mention Devin White, of course, Devin White's no. gonna start, <laughs> but yeah, Devin White and the kicker are the only two guys that's really gonna start unless something crazy happens in the camera. All these guys are better than we think they are, but as of right now, I, I got you, Jay Hall. I, I see that down there. I, I did say that, and I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> but Devin, well, of course, Devin White's going to start barring injury. God forbid. That'd be a waste of time. But <laughs> he's laughing. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, it should be a start. So what I say I was going to do? I said I was going to I was going to tell you my emotions and then talk about the draft picks. But we can go to some of the comments, too, Phil, and see what they got to say, because they're blowing up in here. <laughs> um, All right. We, you got them at the top there? Or are you, where are you starting at? Uh, you want, you want to look there at the top go. and I'll go from the bottom? I'll start. Yeah, sure. Them. Well, you can put them, put them up on the screen. And we'll I am too. Yeah. Because uh, Alvin Brown, I said we never know how you know you we never know how draft picks are going to turn out, so you can't be mad. Yeah, and, exactly. and that's the fan, and that's the fan part in me. I am mad, and I'm not mad because you get a chance to see what these guys can do, and the story hasn't played out. But you can't, you, you can, you can be honest with me, Alvin. You were pretty upset about these draft picks. Seeing a couple <laughs> of those guys on there, the part that put the icing on the cake for me was third round when we traded back. And we didn't take Darrell Henderson, which I'm fine. We have running backs. I understand. But y'all know how I loved Henderson, averaging 8.9 yards a carry. And I almost broke NCAA rushing record and, and is great mm-hmm. catching the pass. Y'all, I expressed my interest for him, but I'm fine on that. But we missed that. And then you let Jalen Ferguson go to the Ravens, where he's probably yeah. going to be the Terrell Suggs' replacement and broke Terrell <laughs> Suggs' yeah. record. How in the hell low? Do we let the guy that broke the record <laughs> go? And he sat there to the third round, and this guy checks all the boxes for run support and pass mm-hmm. rushing. What more can you ask for? 
I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I kind of had Jalen Ferguson as a first round guy uh, at, at the beginning of the and process. It was in the third. And he went in the and third. We you know, <laughs> could have got him in the second. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, you want one from the top? Uh, yeah, let's see what's got, what we got. What we got. Um, Devin White is a great pick from J Ho. I think you read, yeah, read, I that, read one. that one. Yeah, because I, I said I, he, he quoted me correctly. I just said it differently. Uh, right here, we'll just go right into what they actually did in the draft. Dwight Nearing, he says seven DBs, one middle linebacker, and three linemen. <laughs> That's pretty much the whole draft right there, right? <laughs> where where we knew the Bucks needed offensive line help, they needed defensive line help. I mean, they had so many more needs, and they took that many players. You know, what I mean, it, it's. If there's anything that's going to be great about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 2019 is that defensive backfield, uh, barring, barring injury, I mean, they're going to have plenty. Of, they can go in there and start playing linebacker. They can start playing defensive end. Hell, I mean, some of those guys go out there and play wide receiver. I mean, you got plenty of these defensive backs now. Um, I, Like you said, man, we just got to wait and see. I I, I don't know. I, I don't want to start all you talking can say. about it. <laughs> that's, all, that's all you can say with all the defensive backs out. Yeah. Now, like I said, I was going to go into I want to read some of these comments before I go into the part where I understand this is the football part of me that will come yeah. out. Um, Tristan Gay. Oh, you related to the kicker? Um, uh, Tristan yeah, Gay, cool. light strikes again, several years in a row, drafting depth, taking chances on guys with – with hope as opposed to proven commodities. Yeah, it's kind of like what we just said. You passed on guys that were literally studs. You know they're studs, and you wasn't good enough. I don't know. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> that goes to say, too, you know, like a lot of a lot of fans might get caught up in the names that they know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But did you know who Ali Marpet was before the Buccaneers oh, no. draft? I, mean, I wouldn't even you know, pretend. You, some of these guys just need their shot, and I'm not saying that every single guy the Buccaneers drafted is that guy that's that gave him that shot and he's going to excel and he's going to be the next, uh, you know, Pro Bowl or the next All American, all this. But you know, you, you really never know some of these no name guys. I wouldn't say no name, but names that people don't really know about. They could be really, you know, that bright star on the team that really surprises a lot of people. And I think that's what where we need to take a step back and kind of just see what's going to happen and kind of trust what. Uh, Bruce Arians is trying to do with this team and what Todd Bowles' vision is on defense. Because mm -hmm. this was, you know, one of the worst defenses in, uh, you know, the NFL last year, especially in the secondary. All those yards and then all the points and everything. I mean, like you said, we'll get to the football part, but that's where it kind of starts to make a sense and all that. Um, Matt Colson, he's always here. I got to put you up there. We totally went off the chart in this draft. I've never <laughs> seen a draft like this one. So many times I could only say, who? <laughs> they would draft the kicker. Shaking my damn head. I'm shaking it with you. So much that I had to put icy hot on my neck <laughs> because my neck was sore from shaking it back and forth. I would rather be going like this. But unfortunately, it was going like this. Yeah. And, and me and Phil were together. We we just literally looked at each other. We we didn't really have words to say for some of the things <laughs> that were happening. We just wanted to go home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I I don't know Twitter. Twitter, you know how Twitter is with Bucks yeah. fans. It was just like, wow, oh my God, really? Here we go again. Even even Jenna Lane tweeted out, wow, and yep. like yeah, Thomas Bassinger, here we go again. I even tweeted out there. I was like, Jesus, okay, I, I'm so confused. I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> Jay Ha Jay Ha's up here bringing the bringing the fire here. Um, Devin White was a great pick, elite skills, extremely intelligent on and off the field, well spoken. And of and the, my favorite part, he has his own personality. Yeah. Like country boy on the old town road, gonna <laughs> ride till I can no more. Okay. Anyway, boy who loves horses, not not that every single player who just says I love football, football is my life. He loves ball, he loves football, but he is his own person. Yeah, that's true. He does seem yeah. unique. Not taking nothing, not taking nothing from him, and that was never my issue with him. Was just not at five. Like yeah. if a Patrick Willis type of player was out there at five, I'd be all over that. It's Patrick yeah. Willis was both run stuffer, just an annihilator, and great in coverage, and he was fast and he chased yeah. down receivers. But he, he wasn't it. But what it, what's done is done. I have to go on with it. A lot of people who wanted white, we got white, and I, I, I would have been cool with white if the rest of the draft would have you know, lived up to the expectation, but it didn't. So yeah. whatever, I got to deal with it now. Yeah. And so, he's, he's going to have but, that added weight on his shoulders now, you know, being yep. the first linebacker to go in the top five in like forever, you know, and he's either going to bend or he's going to break, or, you know, he's going to actually come out and be that player that everyone thought he was. 
And um, and Bucks fans, do me a favor. Do not put Derrick Brooks' legacy on his shoulders. Yeah. Derrick Brooks has not played on this field in many years. What, 10 <laughs> years plus now? Yeah. Let, yeah. let it go. Every yeah. defensive lineman is not Gerald McCoy. I mean, ooh. There, Warren Sapp, but well, that's true. Too. Every defensive lineman is not McCoy either. But every, every defensive <laughs> lineman is a Warren Sapp. Um, let let that go. Every kicker in ain't um, Martin Gramatica. Let I, let these comparisons go. Stop putting these expectations on these guys and let them live their own legacy. Like he said, he has his own personality. Let him mm-hmm. make his own. I, I'm just tired of hearing that every draft, bringing it back. Oh, they're doing this. They're gone. Gruden's not here coaching anymore. Monty's not coaching here anymore. It's done. Mm-hmm. I said, they got to bring. We got to bring our own. We got to bring our own flavor now in 2019. We're we're an offensive friendly team now. Back then we were defensive friendly. Uh, we we, we got to build our own identity here. We got to let it go. I'm just saying, don't put that on his head already. Because yeah. I already know somebody's going to ask him, what do you think about Derrick Brooks being an undersized linebacker coming out, drafted and coming to be a Hall of Famer in the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? He's going to get that question several times. And I'm, tired of, and I'm tired of hearing it for him. Yeah. Uh, and, and me as a player, you know, you know what the most annoying thing was, Phil, as a player every day before game day when I would see uh, all the other students and stuff in there, the one thing I used to hate, and they used to say, "Are you gonna win today?" I hated that question. I hated that question. No, we're just we're gonna go out there and lose. I mean, I mean, what else do you want me to say? Um, but uh, what was I getting into? Oh, the understanding the draft picks. All right. So as of right now, I don't think Conti's coming back. He's still in La La Land. You might see him in the End Game that came out Friday. If you see Chris Conti somewhere in in Avengers End Game, please let me know. I will send you out a Bucks Report T-shirt myself. Just take a <laughs> snapshot of him. If you see him anywhere where they disappeared, let me know. If you see him, Chris Conti. If you see him, I will send a Bucks Report shirt to you myself. But with that being said. When we're talking about talking about the football version, so your safeties right now are Justin Evans, Jordan Whitehead. Those are your youth. Justin Evans now the veteran now. Uh, you mm-hmm. let go to Andrew Adams is gone now. Conti is gone now. And uh, what was the other boy that we kept we kept here for years from Iowa? They kept kept playing. I can't think of his name. Escapes me. But he was released as well. Uh, so you you're literally left with two safeties. MJ Stewart's going, from what I understand and heard, he's going to be moving back to safety because yeah. uh, he's not a nickel corner. He played in the box at uh, UNC as a zone and like run support type of guy, but he's not a man to man zone guy, and that's just not what yeah. he's asked to do because he doesn't really have the foot speed, but he's really physical. Now he's built yeah, like a safety. It's a I'm, yeah. I'm happy to see him move to something more comfortable. Um, so. With that, that moves them up, so that makes you have three safeties now, but it's without counting the draft pick. So White, Whitehead, Evans, Stewart are your safeties, just insane before draft picks. So that leaves you with Hardgraves on the outside, Carlton Davis, and um, Hardgraves, Carlton Davis, whose name I'm missing right now? Uh, well, other than Ryan Smith. but Ryan, Yeah, Ryan Smith. So those are your corners. Yeah, that, those are your, those are your three corners and your three safeties. So now depth is real, really thin when you just put it like that, because that's really who's here right now. Yeah. Besides, if you want to pick up people off the street, which we did for the past three years, so that's why I said I kind of understand picking up DB because that's what we did for the past three years. Just kept picking up guys on the street, and hopefully we can find something uh, valuable out of it. And we found Andrew Adams for the short period of times, but that's not a long term deal. I'm kind of glad that he didn't stick with him. Um, we'd rather build our own guys here. Um, yeah. So now you pick up two more corners, so that fills in two more spots, <clears throat> and then you pick up another safety. So now you have four safeties now um, back there with uh, the boy coming out of uh, – Mike Edwards coming out of Kentucky. Yeah, and then you pick up um, Sean Bunting and Jamil Dean, which Jamil Dean was a guy – I think you saw my uh, mock draft before I had him on there. Very yeah. fast corner. It's just injuries. I think he injured both knees, but he's very fast, and, he, and he's got some decent ball skills, something he can work at. And he was very familiar with Carlton Davis as well, the many re- main reasons I picked him there because he, he had a familiar face here. And that's the thing about a lot of guys that come here. They're not from this area, so they don't know anybody here. Just think about you moving somewhere, and you have no idea who anybody is, and you come here, yeah. and you don't know where to go. You don't know who to trust. Yeah, think about that. You got these are people too. They forget the football aspect. They're still people. They yeah. there's, there's stuff they don't know. Don't know where to go. They don't know something. That's why I think people overanalyze things when people make mistakes and do this. They're still people. Money has nothing to do with your personal experience or life experiences in life. It has nothing yeah. to do with that. Um, 
And that's the secondary. You got the two corners and the safety. So that pretty much fills in the depth. The uh, only person I think is on the bubble probably is uh, Ryan Smith. He's had chance yeah. after chance after chance to prove something here. And he was a pretty good returner out of North Carolina. So I was very familiar with because that's around almost not too far from where I grew up in Fayetteville. So I was familiar with uh, uh, North Carolina Central's um, uh, football program there. And they have a very, very good football program in North Carolina Central. But uh, I think he's the one on the bubble. What do you think, Phil? I rambled on for like five minutes straight. No, you're good. No, I, was <laughs> saying, I was saying the same thing on Twitter on uh, my full press coverage, Buccaneers handle, you know, Ryan Smith's going to be the odd man out. Mm-hmm. And then you start to look at if these two guys work out, what's going on with Vernon Hargraves? They just picked up his fifth year option. Um, doesn't mean he's going to be on the team in 2020. You know, they have until the start of the new league year uh, to either, you know, say he's going to play on the team or cut him. So you, you really start to, you really start to feel what Todd Bowles really wants out of this defense um, through this draft, especially in the second and third round when we got these cornerbacks and safety. He wants speed on the outside. He wants speed on the inside. And he wants physical guys at the line, guys that can play the man-on-man coverage, play with the hands, slow down the receivers, cut the routes, you know, try to get the interceptions, all that kind of stuff. So that's where the football part comes in, like you were just saying. You know, mm-hmm. you really start to see, okay, this ha- this team had the worst secondary in the league last year. How can we fix it? What do we need to do? Who plays in the division that we play in? I mean, you got Julio Jones, you know, one of the best receivers in the game right now. Who's going to cover him? I mean, Carlton Davis did a pretty great job of it last season. But it's Julio. But it's Julio Jones. Mm-hmm. you got to have guys that can cover guys like that. And being being a fast guy like that, you know, you still have to have guys that can be able to break speed, catch them down the sideline, whatever you need. And then you also have to look at the what, what we have in the division um, as far as running backs. I mean, you got Christian McCaffrey, you have Alvin Kamara. And, you know, these are guys that you have to contain. That's why he drafted these cornerbacks and the safety. These guys are very physical. They're really good run stoppers coming down, playing downhill on the field, uh, stopping, you know, the running backs from breaking that third level of the defense. So that's where I start to see, you know, Todd Bowles can kind of end this draft, guys that he thinks going to fit his physical um, punch you in the mouth type defense. Absolutely. And uh, as I said, I'm going to leave it to the professional. Hopefully he's got a plan. Hopefully he's got a plan. But I said, right now, we're not happy. Now, I don't think I went into enough about, you know, Devin White and what he's going to bring to this team, especially with the 3-4. Um, me, personally, dealing with that as as a new system um, uh, from, from when I left high school and started playing on the other level, um, we were we – were tra- that, that they were transitioning to a 3-4. I think we were pretty – we had veterans on that team at that time uh, – and I played strong. I played strong side inside for that for that squad. It was a little developmental league out in Delaware, and um, I played strong side inside linebacker for them. And we had pretty good defense, and we were pretty good um, um, inside inside defense alignment. So um, he, if you if you got pretty good interior defense alignment in the three four system, you. Um, your linebackers can get real rangy and they can get sideline to sideline because from what I saw a lot with Devin White, I, I, don't, I didn't really see him too much shedding blocks on our offensive linemen once they got their hands on him. But the thing about him was his speed and yeah. he can get around blocks. And that's why it's important of people eating up blocks. That's why I thought Veil maybe be a real good uh, end in that system, be like a Holy Nagata type of player, Justin Smith type of player, where he could he could use his size and his strength in one-on-one situations. Um and beat people like he's not he's not really a a, a pass rusher and i get tired of hearing that with well, defensive tackles well they're not putting up sacks like sacks aren't the only no- thing that matter in football yeah. like pressures and and uh tip passes and force throws the interception all of that ties in together you just can't measure up sacks especially yeah. as an interior defense alignment that's why only a certain amount of interior defensive linemen are studs and pass rushing because all of them aren't all of them don't do that. It's just not your system to make up. It's just yeah. today's and today you have a little bit more that make those kind of plays, but those only happen when you have other intangibles and there are other players that could take people off the heat. I take the heat off of them. That's why when people get on McCoy, I know a lot of people, you know, get on and down about him. He's never had the help JJ Watt has had. He's never had the help Aaron Donald's had. He's never had the help Geno Atkins had. I, and I name all those names and Nadama and Sue had. So those are the only other guys that are either at or above him in sacks in the, in the league right now that have played the many years that he played. Yeah, uh, and he's done all that with zero help. Yeah, so you have to put that in perspective when you dog the man out. Like he did that with no help his entire yeah. career, and 
and, and we're talking about McCoy with, with the lack of defensive line that we picked up. Um, you kind of got to keep him now. You, you have you picked up no stud defensive end. You picked up no stud defensive tackle. I do like uh, Terry Buckner. I like the what what caught me on to him is he plays with an attitude coming out of Missouri oh, yeah. and SEC. Yep, he comes punch, with the funk. Yeah, he comes with the funk, and I like that. I like that energy. That's the kind of stuff you need to change this team. Somebody plays like that. That's what we need here. I thought these guys all humdrum. Oh, I got to get back up and walk to the huddle again so I can get my butt kicked again and give up these yards running. I don't need that crap here no more. I know you're getting paid, but I, Jesus Christ, man, come out here and put out some work, Bo Allen. Come out here and put up some work, William Golston. Yeah, I'm talking to you, and I hope y'all see it, and I mean it. Um, put in some work. They say you said last year, William Golston admitted himself that he should have been cut coming into the 2019 season because you produced zero sacks. Same as bad as I had last year. Oh, so yeah, I didn't play. <laughs> you got an arm in there. Um, one of the <laughs> and, um, and, and I think Golston's done. So I think you can you can get the money to keep him care at, at, at keep McCoy even at the 13. I hope he restructures at least a little bit. But you can you can keep him because I know with these two picks with Buckner and Anthony Nelson uh coming, uh I think William Golston's days are numbered. Yeah. It's gotta uh, be need a little over nine million dollars to sign these guys, and they've got about two. So <laughs> um, but the kind kind of piggyback off what you were saying, you know, a few mm-hmm. minutes ago, kind of about you know the Gerald McCoy thing, you know, not having help all this or whatnot. You got you gotta remember what Todd Bowles is gonna do this year. They're gonna be a, a single gap rushing team. They're only right. gonna shoot one gap. Okay. You need Vita Vea in the middle. You need a Gerald McCoy in the middle to take up those, uh, you know, B and C gap blocks so that you can have a Devin White come in, so you can have a Levante mm-hmm. David come in, or you can have the guys on the edge, Carl Nassib. I'm looking for him to have a huge Oh, yeah, me too. I love him. Dude, He's he's got this motor on him. That just I want, like, 10 more of him on the defensive he, line. He plays what I just said about – um um. Beck, Beckner, if I'm pronouncing it right, yeah, Buckner, he, yeah. yeah Beckner, yeah, he pl- he plays with an attitude because the Browns cut him, they didn't give him time, and you kind of kicked him to the curb, and he had a chance to rekindle his fire, and he did that here. He played with an attitude. He did. Him and JPP playing off of each other, especially I think it was the Eagles game when I mean they were just beating up on uh, what's his name? I can't remember his name Foles. now. Yeah, Foles. I mean, it, it was it was great to see. We need two more of those guys, you know, to play either on the inside or play on the outside, maybe linebacker. And that's when you start to look at Noah Spence. How does Noah Spence fit into this? Were they thinking about Noah Spence prior to the draft, before they started drafting players, before they started drafting all these defensive backs? Do they really see him being that outside stand-up linebacker on this 3-4 defense? You know, and that's another thing, too, fans really get, um, you know, kind of mix up. You know, they're going to be in the nickel 60 to 70% of the time, so they're going to have that. That four three kind of front, but when those three four situations come up, who are those guys that they really want to rush the passer? And that's where I kind of start to see what they want to do in the draft. They feel like they have you know the guys on that defensive line that can really do it, you know, give them that extra second. So these fast defensive backs that we now have can make plays on the ball, can jump the line or jump the receiver, run the routes for him. And that's kind of like what I'm starting to understand with Jason Light, what he did in this draft. They trust the guys they have up front, and they trust the coaching. Now, coaching has been a big issue for the Buccaneers for the past, you know, several years. We haven't had those coaches that can really coach these guys up and train them to be, you know, the best that they can be. Play their brand of football. Play to their strengths, what they do best, instead of trying to make them play a system. And Mike Smith's system, confusing. I'm going to tell you right now. Yeah, I know I said the name. people in the back. <laughs> Mike Smith's system was so confusing. There's so much dialogue in that thing. There's so many different things that you have to understand in Mike Smith's defense. Now we have a coaching staff in here that understands this player might not get it like this other player does. So let's start the game plan around what this player does best. That's why I think Noah Spence is going to have a comeback season. And that's why I think Carl Nassim is going to be a nasty guy this season. Absolutely. You said you said that well. I, know, I got fired up, man. What's yeah. Peter at? Yeah. <laughs> is that Peter in you? <laughs> um, I was just going to some of the comments here. These guys are fired up, man. Like over 85 comments already. Um he said, I agree. Uh, let me post him up. Justin Gazico, I agree with both of you. I wanted to turn it off <laughs> after the second <laughs> pick. Same draft as last year. Six DVs in the last two drafts. Yeah, I'm not going to go into that, but yes. Um, 
Yeah, I agree. Johnny Dean, oh, Lord, you know he's in here. Johnny Dean, I'm neither disappointed nor excited. Love the undrafted player, though, with the with the blind right eye. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the yeah, I think it was. yeah. yeah. Um, we get to see what he see what he does, bringing a guy like that. Um, Dean, again, I had to address secondary, worst secondary in the league. Eventually, yeah, you had to. But I think a lot of the demise was was Hargraves going down, especially playing really, really well the entire offseason, playing nickel and press coverage. That was sad, and I would have loved to see how that played out. Yeah, me too. Um, White defense of the year. He's going to be playing, you know, that the man, the man that – that uh on the line kind of covers not the backup zone play 15 yards off like Mike Smith had him. So I think that kind of lit the fire up with him. And especially if you watch the draft at all and see these cornerbacks that the Bucks ears picked, you know, it's, it's kind of, that's kind of the cool thing about football. You watch all these, these draft picks get picked by the team that you play for. And a couple of them might be the positions that you play for. Now you're going to have that, you know, that thing on your shoulder, that fraud, or whatever you want to call it, you know, mm-hmm. whisper in your ear, Hey, if you don't make this play, right. They're going to replace you with this guy. If you don't do this good, this guy's going to take your spot. That lights a fire up his butt. And then that's going to be a whole different player that we see on the field. That's why I kind of like the draft when you start to look at after who they pick and we get into the off season, mm-hmm. and really start to see people battle. I think that really makes it exciting uh, for your team to get better. Right. Roy Williams, <laughs> he didn't like that. He said, Gerald McCoy stays hurt too much. He's overpaid. Man, give me a break. Stays hurt because he he's forced to play as he comes yep. out. Yep. Well, who's going to replace him? Warren I mean, Sapp showed that plenty of times on his Twitter feed. What happens when McCoy's not in the game? It's, it's a little different. You can't run in certain gaps, but you can run in others. I mean, like I said, we'll, we'll agree to disagree, but I think we can all agree on that the team failed him. You never gave yeah. this man any help. And the help you did have, you let go to Seattle to win a Super Bowl, and his name is Michael Bennett. And that was little the only help he's had, except last year. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at some of these comments. Our secondary is trash. What are you talking about? I'm agreeing our secondary was trash. Yeah, uh, I, don't know, <laughs> yeah that's Roy, I, said, I don't know who he's arguing. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't for me. But 29 points a game, that's, I don't think I need to say any more. Nope. Um, Tristan goes at it again. Light strikes again. Several years in a row, drafting death, taking chances on guys with hope as opposed to proven commodities. Yep, that was what I was talking about with Jalen Ferguson. Sat to the third round. Uh, mm-hmm. Then he took a safety. He traded back and then took a safety. Um, it's tough not, you know, okay. We should have taken... Joel Young says we should have taken a D in the second round. The guy from Iowa is good, but we could have gotten a great DE in the second. And um, you talking about Anthony Nelson. Yeah, Anthony Nelson. When I watch his tape, he reminds me a lot of um, he. They they basically replaced it replaced um, Will Goldston with a tall defensive three four, not really a, a four three edge rushing guy. But like a uh, like more of a run stout guy that can get a little bit of pass rush. I think that's why they went with him because they're both like six seven, around the yeah. same height and weight. But it seems like he's got a little bit more pass rush ability and ability to push the the pocket back and get to um, the quarterback. But I don't really expect a whole lot of sacks from him. He's more of yeah. a pocket pusher and a one gap player. I think if you just focus him on a one gap, I think. Um, He'll be really productive in his draft. And I think you heard me before say about what Bowles' system when I've posted the photos before, Phil. I got to get back into that with the football. <laughs> when I used to say, I don't, know, I don't remember you were with us when I used to break down no, game tape, when I used to do game tape sessions. No, but I, I did see some of that stuff. Yeah, before. when I used to get, I got to get back to doing that. It's, it's pretty much they're just going to line up three guys and you're just going to blow up that gap. And then you're going to send the guy off the edge or you're going to send a guy on the backside on the blitz. That's pretty mm-hmm. much what Bowles' defense is going to look like. And, but if you get your defensive lineman to blow up those gaps, then there's no pocket to throw in. Then you get them to pull down and either scramble and try to find a receiver and get a sack. That's what I kind of see with some of these guys. And I think Spence and a lot of these guys might benefit from this defense. I really hope so because we haven't been good on second round picks. So, I mean, um, yeah, what you got, Phil? Anything? <laughs> no, I'm saying exactly what you're saying, you know, bust that gap and then have these yeah. fast guys that you drafted in this draft covering, uh, come down and cover yeah. you know, the box. Somebody said one, two, eight defense. <laughs> one, two, eight. <laughs> one defense lineman, two linebackers, eight DBs. <laughs> hey, um, if it works, it works, right? Oh, no, Lord. See. That'd be interesting. Maybe you should put that in, Bowles, if you check this out. One, two, eight. Just for me. You can That's call it Blake, Blake Special. Um, <laughs> oh, Dean, I love the reaction from this draft. We addressed major needs as far as we didn't 
didn't six draft i probably saying six dbs in this draft and did people study the prospects grades please now a lot of people you know a lot of people don't really watch or just this is dean i'm talking to um a lot of people don't really watch a whole lot of college football let alone just one player and stuff like that all they really have to go on is uh the combine and the highlight tapes uh that you see everybody watches on youtube and everybody looks good on your highlight tape uh what a lot of us at bucks report did and i know my eyes were tired of looking at it. i watched actual games and big games and um and, and that's really how i made my decisions and that and the only reason i really didn't put Devin white at five was because i watched the biggest game was against alabama and i watched another game um, even Louisiana Tech, well, no, he played well in Louisiana Tech. Um, it was the biggest games and see how they fare. You know, they got blown out 29 to nothing, and Bama ran for 300 yards on yeah. Devin White's defense, and he really was little to no factor in that game. Um, and that's about as close as to an NFL offense you're going to get playing against Alabama, especially against the run. And they had two of that year, so they were pretty good for passing and um, running the ball. But he is a, an unbelievable athlete. Um, that I cannot deny, and I really hope that he plays well here and earns his own respect and earns his own name here in uh, Tampa Bay. Yeah, and like you were saying at the draft party, you know, you got to look at their worst game, you got to look at their best mm-hmm. game, and that's kind of where you can start to see is this player actually any good, or it's just the conference that they play and they're not really having that talent or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Tristan Sin says we can't even name clearly name no guy. We can't even name a projected starter. No, not at this time, especially with Aaron's. He said, hard to name somebody to start if you're not here. I just love what Aaron says. This this stuff makes sense. And and yeah. fans and everybody can relate to this man. And he said, What kind of offense are you gonna run today? Bruce Arians? I'm gonna run one that 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 uh where the best matchup is. That's what I'm gonna run. The one where the guy's gonna get open. That yep. could change every week. If that matchup works, if it's OJ Howard, it's gonna go to OJ. If it's mm-hmm. gonna go to Mike, it's gonna go to Mike. If it's gonna go to Godwin, it's gonna go to Godwin. You you don't try to make think force. You don't try to force a, a, a triangle in a circle. If it's not gonna, if it's not gonna work, then then don't try to force it in there. Um, like Dirk Cutter was, he said, regardless of what coverage exactly. or what what game plan they're gonna play against, we're gonna play the same exact offense, no matter what the defense comes. And and look at it, we never made any halftime adjustments. We come out with the same plan, and nothing ever happens. That's been the Tampa Bay Buccaneer way since um, Dirk Cutter's come to town. I totally agree. And you always see that. You're always like, all right, they got to make this second and a half change. They got to start running Peyton Barber. They got to start moving somebody in right guard. It's the same thing. Sean Jackson goes out deep. They miss him. They start messing around with Adam Humphreys, Cameron Bray, get them going. Then Mike Evans gets the first downs. It's the same game every single time. So I'm excited to see Bruce Arians offense. It's going to be electric. I think you're going to take a little bit more shots down the field, but I think, with his coaching, Jameis Winston's going to do a little better with that. And you start to get those bodies that are the big body guys really playing in the game, like the OJ Howards, the Mike Evans. And now you have Perryman, kind of fast guy. So a little off subject with the draft, but no, you do about the offense. <laughs> we talk about so much, so you got to jump back and forth sometimes. <laughs> and then with the comments, so you're you're totally fine. Um, and, and another part, I don't think, you know, pay attention to little things that they say, especially Bruce Arians. He's pretty – Think of a business. This is a business. I ain't going to say think of it. NFL is a business. Tampa Bay Buccaneers yeah. are a business. This ain't your college team. This ain't your higher school team that you go up and root for. This is a business now. But mm-hmm. that being said, if you look at him, the way he runs his practice, he rolls around in the golf cart and oversees something. That's what you do as owner. You, you oversee – well, we'll say well, we'll say GM. You oversee uh, standard – make sure standard operating procedures are running correctly in your facility. Yeah. SOP, standard operator. If everybody knows the business, I'm sure you know what that means. SOP. That's what the GM is supposed to do. You're supposed to oversee everybody and you let your 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 managers do what they're supposed to do. And when I mean managers, those are your coaches and your position coaches. You let mm-hmm. them do their job. He's not trying to micromanage. He's letting them do what they're supposed to do. So there's no miscommunication. Oh, Bowles, you're doing that. But I want you to make him run at the B gap instead on that play. Just that play, because I like the way he loops inside on that. No, you let these guys do their job um, and, and left which is going to do his job um, being the passing coordinator, not the offensive coordinator. He's the passing coordinator. I know a lot of people were getting worried about that. He's, he's the passing coordinator. I'm sure he's going to help Arians on plays and stuff like that, but um, he lets these guys do their job, and, and we're actually running a team like we're supposed to do. And and in doing that, you're building more 
you're, you're building your brand within your facility. And what I mean by that is that you, when you do that and people get comfortable in the way you run your business and your establishment, you can promote with him. So maybe Bowles becomes their head. So head coach, maybe left, which moves to OC and then um, Bowles moves to our head coach. Once Arians, his time is expired or whatever. He wants to go back to his family. You're building within your own community. Like we did with back in the day with, um, um, with the Buccaneers where you had uh, – where we let um, – what's the head coach of the Steelers now? We're escaping my mind. Mike Tomlin. Mike Tomlin was one of ours, went on – went on to coach somewhere else and went multiple Super Bowl, Super Bowl. Raheem Morris was one of ours, was on that roster at that time when he won a Super Bowl. Things like that, and like the Green Bay Packers is the one that I would like to bring up the most is they had Gruden, they had Andy Reid, you had yeah. Holmgren, you had Meyer Steve Mariucci. Those are all guys you had under one umbrella, and all mm-hmm. those guys are, are left their mark on the league in the league in the NFL on teams all over the, in broadcast and stuff. I really want to bring something like that to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I'm tired of being uh, overlooked and laughed at and looked up and I, and then you got to look out for handouts and stuff like that. I'm not with that anymore. I want us building our own brand. So I really want these fans to get to come together now and stop fighting over who's going to be the quarterback and stuff like that. Like, I know you don't like Winston for whatever it was or off the field, but just to say that the guy's not good as far as on the field. I don't know many scrub quarterbacks that throw for 4,000 yards back to back. Please. I don't know many of them that do that. Does he have stuff to work on? Absolutely. Do I make excuses for him sometimes? Yeah, I do. I'm I'm not going to lie. We're, we're, we're a fan. I want to see the guy succeed, but uh, there's, there's some things that we need to fix that would help him and help the team move forward. What you think, Phil? No, I totally agree with you. And Clifton Smith uh, kind of was saying pretty much what you were saying uh, when I interviewed him. You know, he's saying Bruce Arians brings this whole new dynamic to the Buccaneers that the Buccaneers haven't had in a long time. He's brought in these coaches like Byron Leftwich, you know, Todd Bowles, even uh, Keith Armstrong special teams. I mean, that's literally one of the best special team coaches in the league. He Look who he's worked with. Look how well the Falcons have played on special teams throughout the years with Matt Bryan and whatnot. And so his his point was getting, you know, you have to trust the process. You have to trust that these guys are going to take the guys that Dirk Cutter had that couldn't get things working. And he's really going to try and act, or not try, but he will make things work. He's going to have the players play to what they can do. And he's going to make it all work out so the players actually win and start to be more confident. And that it was a great interview with Cousin Smith. I mean, he got kind of passionate in the middle about that stuff. But you know, I'm, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm right on the side with him. You know yeah. what I'm saying? He knows it. He's seen it before. He's been around. You know, he knows what's going to happen. And that's when, you know, fans really got to start to trust a little, the process a little bit more. You know, the Buccaneers, you know, they might go eight and eight this season, but that's a big step up from five and 11. Um, and especially seeing what Dirk Cutter did last season. Okay. We re- regressed instead of progress with Dirk yeah. Cutter. That's all we yeah. did in the nine to seven season. Mm-hmm. I just I just didn't think Carter really instilled fire into the guys. He made a couple nice rah rah speeches when we were in a big game, but it's can you get those same motivation out of guys when you would have a disappointing loss? Is what really makes you different makes the difference in a real coach. And the one thing that everybody loved about the big tuna when he used to coach Dallas and and, and the Patriots and all them back in the day is that and LT the Giants and all them is how he used to motivate players, and that's the kind of guy you need. Uh, in an organization and in a locker room and stuff like that. These, these dudes are fun, life, though, man. You, you got to motivate your people that are work with you, the people that are under you, or they're not going to be productive. <laughs> they're, then they're, it's a, the, I don't like to call people children, but this is the best metaphor I could come up. The children have to see the parent, uh, the, the energy of the parent, for them to see what expectation they're supposed to be. If you guys get what, what metaphor I'm saying, I'm trying to call grown men children. That's just the best metaphor I could come up with. And that's the kind of thing you need from the top on down. And I think light, I think the main reason light like Arians too, you don't have to kind of babysit him. He's going to kind of know what he's doing and let him do his job. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go on with some more of the question. These guys are blowing this thing up, Phil. Um, oh, yeah. Dude has drafted no starters. Dude that's drafted no starters on D, who got a second contract aside from Jameis Winston and Evans, who were both consecutive consensus picks. The O line were drafted. The O line we drafted were bottom rung in the fifties as far as ranking. I understand hidden gems, but he hasn't found one yet. I think he's trying to say that instead of finding slam dunk players, we're trying to dig out the bot the garbage and hopefully pull out a gem. I think that's what he's trying to say. If that's what you got from that. 
and we just I, haven't worked out on it. I mean, you, Ali Marpet got a second contract. Donovan Smith got a second contract. You talk trash about Donovan Smith all you want, but I mean, that guy, he's reliable. I mean, how many games does he miss? None. None. <laughs> he made he's just a few snaps. I mean, he's got things he's got to work on, but if he would have left his team um, in the offseason, somebody else would have paid him and made him the highest, you know, left tackle in the league. Where are the Buccaneers sitting at? Who are they getting off the street? No mm-hmm. one. I, mean, I, I understand you, you don't want to be happy with what you have, just be happy with what you have, but he's not that bad of a player. The real big issue on this offensive line is going to be on that right side. And I think we're going to see either they're going to pick somebody up in free agency or pick someone off the street to help fill that right guard spot and that right tackle spot. No, no, we did not address it at all. And that was one of the things I was I was looking forward to uh, in the third round. I was nice. thinking second round defensive end, defensive tackle, third round offensive tackle, and we nothing, not even glimpse and, look at it or whatever. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because we kind of got sidetracked on that. They didn't address the offensive line. No. That right I mean, guard. The players that they drafted a kicker right and guard is wide open. It's it's butt naked. Right guard is wide open, yep. just like it was in 2018. Wide open. Yep. I got Alex Kappa. I guess they're putting their cards on him. Or I, I read something saying about Ben Ox going to play right guard also, not moving him to tackle anymore. Mm-hmm. Or at least I think that's what something said. Yeah, right, he's going to play right tackle because that's what he is. Is his tackle? Yeah, exactly. So, but that still leaves a question mark at right guard. I know they just they signed a guy in free agency. I cannot remember his name. Uh, he's going to play at right guard position too. But you 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 need to solidify that right side of the line, especially playing Bruce Arians' offense, where we see the quarterback. You know he is not going to have a lot of time to throw the ball and really think about what he has to do. He has to go through his regressions kind of quickly, try to get the ball as fast as he can. You saw Big Ben; he was getting knocked down all those years ago when Arians, you know, had him under him. So. You got to solidify that right side of the line. You got to figure out maybe a guy, a UDFA, they find that they sign. Maybe a guy they get in training camp, a tryout. Maybe that's something they're going to do. But until then, there's still a glaring need on the, on the right side of the line. Absolutely. Again, offensive line ain't a pretty pick. It ain't something we strive for, except for me. I love offense and defensive line. I mean, I'll, I'll be happy all day. You spend your money on offense. Me too. That's me. Um, you can't you can't pass the ball. You can't run the ball without offensive line. You can't do neither. I mean, look at the Dallas Cowboys. Look at the Indianapolis Colts. They've been drafting offensive linemen for years, and they finally have a good unit. With Quentin Nelson, that was the cog, the key to the cog, boy. A couple of picks away from him or Bradley Chubb, Jesus. Which it seems like we're always a hand's reach out of what we need every year. That would have been so nice to have grabbed one of them last year. It just seems like we're always a step behind, and here we are again. Looks like we're a step behind again, but we'll see. Um, we'll go on some of these. Uh, Tristan Gay is going at it. Not mad at the Edwards pick. Yeah, I talked about it. I love that. I love the energy. Uh, oh, he's about Edwards safety, rangy safety. I'm thinking DN. Yeah, he's a rangy safety with Kentucky. Benefited a lot off of Josh Allen's pass rushing ability. Again, it's much easier to play secondary when you know the ball's got to come out in three seconds. You can be aggressive. Uh, oh, yeah. versus uh quarterback has all day to pat his, wipe the dirt off his offensive lineman back and still throw the ball for 40 <laughs> yards downfield because he's wide open. It's a huge yeah. difference how you play coverage. Um, if anybody's ever played, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can't cover guys like this for that long. That's a, a big field and a lot of field to cover. Yep. Um, right back to the next play. Yep, you got to come right back to the next play. Call Matt Colston. Oh, he just said what I was saying. We need a D-line and O-line. Are we expecting to find a stud and undrafted free agents? That's kind of like what what's the name was saying earlier. Keep picking out the garbage, trying to find something. Um, there was a there was a reason they went undrafted. I just don't understand the methods. Yeah, it just seems like we're trying to find gold and we keep finding fool's gold. <laughs> oh, Johnny Dan says Ramblin' Blake instead of Rossi. Yeah, Ramble. What? Bringing the fire, bringing the passion, me and Phil bringing it. So Peter's <laughs> off tonight, so it's the Phil and Blake show tonight, not the Blake and Blake. Still got a nice ring to it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rolls off the tongue pretty well. <laughs> Matt says he tends to agree. He tends to agree more with Blake than Rossi. See, Rossi's a little more political than I am. I'm not really into all that. I just speak from a player's perspective and mm-hmm. try to throw my spice on it. Am I wrong? Yes, I'm wrong. I have no problem admitting I'm wrong. I, no problem. I have an opinion just like everybody else. Just don't get offended and get up in arms. I, I like disagreements. It's fun. Because if everybody agreed with everything, it would be boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Falcons got first, got five first round picks on their O line. Oh yeah, they loaded up on the offensive yeah. line. Well, Matt Ryan got sacked forty three times, and then yeah. they got Ryan. Jameis Winston was and Matt Ryan, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick was sacked many times, and we drafted no men. No. And you know that was something that I, you know, I was really starting to think about when I was watching the Falcons draft. You know, they they understand they play in the NFC South, and now they have JPP they got to worry about. And you start to look at Carolina; they took the guy that I really wanted all day, Brian Burns. I really Yo, you wanted. saw that. You should have known Panthers going to go defensive line. And and now now we got to worry about him, you know, on this offensive line that yeah, missing people. To play in. So, I mean, Falcons, I think had they they knew what they needed to do, and they went and got it done. Hopefully, that offensive line grows for him. Not saying hopefully because I hope they beat us or anything, but I'm saying you know as looking at it as a football, just just as a football idea, you know, they built they're building what they need to for from the offensive line up, right. Yep, that's how you do it, man. You got to build from the, the hog mollies on both ends, and then everything else can fall in line. I said it before. I said it many times. The New York Giants won two Super Bowls against the Patriots with third string corners. I don't yeah. need to say anything else. Um, Mesa Dor, um, Sean Bunting is solid. He is very yeah. good, and his hit and his hit and his movements are also flips and runs well. Just watch. I agree. He is a receiver that turned to I'm glad you brought this up because I want to say this too. I ramble a little bit. He's a receiver that turned to corner. And I wanted to say that he reminds me of the Green Bay's corner um that came out of Miami, in which he was a uh he was a receiver at Miami and flipped the DB. Usually if you have bad receivers uh, bad hands as a receiver, you yeah. flip to DB. So which you transition the skills just differently. Now you're instead of being the runner, you're the chaser. Mm-hmm. And the name Sam Shields. I command him Sam Shields. Oh, and then Sam Shields I followed in college and, and stuff like that. And he went, I think he went undrafted, but he switched his position from wide receiver to DB. Lo and behold, I think he was a Pro Bowl corner at one point and got a second contract out there in Green Bay and re-solidified his career and then ended it with that nasty injury. Um, but yeah, he's one player. It's possible. It's very possible. And I kind of like that, you know, transitioning, having a wide receiver go to play cornerback or play mm-hmm. safety, because they understand how these wide receivers run routes. And what do you want from your cornerbacks? You want them to run the wide receiver's routes so you can pick off the quarterback, get the ball back, put the ball back in the offense hand, give the defense a break. That's why I really like these guys that transition to that defensive side of the ball because they understand, you know, maybe he's going to do this little cut move, but you know this little cut move means he's going to run to the left. You know what I mean? So that's when you start to get those really good players that start to get picks, and then the quarterback gets scared. He's not going to throw to that side anymore, and it just it kind of snowballs from there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh oh. Matt Colston, fire brain the fire today. Is the D line set with or without McCoy? We still haven't resolved that deal yet. Where's the money coming from? I oh. love the voice you do when you read people's stuff. <laughs> I mean, I think we were talking about this a little while ago. So I want to ask Phil a question. If you a two part question. And you guys answer this too. And I got another question too. Do you guys like the hat? No, you don't you don't like the hat. I try to style it up. I try to do baseball hats. Do you guys like that? Leave a leave a yes if you like the hat. But the two part question with that. One, Phil, do you keep or you let go of McCoy? We'll start with that. And now we looking pre draft or right now? Oh, we're talking about right now. I'm keeping McCoy. I'm not getting rid of him now. Who who else do they have on the defensive line? Fair enough. All right. With that, with that, who do you get rid of? To save uh, eight point five. That's what you need. That's the number eight point five to save the uh, to sign the rookies. Let's see. Will Golson has what three point seven five? I think he gets this year. Mm-hmm. Oh man, Carry Osante. Right. I think that's a little over a million dollar contract. Yep. And then you have Ryan Smith, who has I think a two million dollar contract. Is it that much? I I think it's like a two million dollar contract. Yeah, because they brought him back. Uh, I think last season or the season before. Um, I don't know. Getting tight, uh, ain't it? Get tight. The question is, do, do you keep or hold on the break? I honestly, yes. If you want to see this offense score points like they have been and really, you know, build, build up the yards and hopefully the defense backs them up and holds them off and holds the opposing offenses off so they don't score more points than they do. Um, I think the two tight end thing really works for Jameis Winston as long as OJ Howard can stay healthy. I mean, the more pass catchers he has, you know, the more dynamic the defense or the offense is going to be. And at some point, Cameron Brait led the league in touchdowns over, I right. think, a three-year span. 
I mean, that's pretty impressive place for the Buccaneers. You know, one of the worst teams in the league for the past uh, three or four years. I think you keep Cameron Bray unless you get some kind of like rich package, you know, some dra- or some uh, cap space money. You get a player here, Patrick Peterson. I would love to have Patrick Peterson. Well, you got uh, to money to have that. You got to have money. That's what I'm saying. Cameron Bray might be that thing, but I don't see them getting rid of Cameron Bray, and I would not like to see Cameron Bray be gone. I love him too. I don't. I didn't. But sad to see Humphreys goes, but I'm happy he left because he earned money. He earned a big contract, getting nine million years money that he earned being an undrafted player. That's that's what I mean by happy to see him go, not in a negative way. I was yeah. happy he got a chance to earn his money. And if anybody earned it, it him. Didn't oh, yeah. whine, didn't complain, did his job, game in and game out, and became reliable and available, being the fourth string receiver. I think anybody that has a half a brain knows that that man deserved his contract. And even like I think it was seventy five percent of his touchdowns were in the red zone. Yep. I mean, that's what you want in any player that's going to catch the ball. You know, always being that clutch guy, catching the balls in the end zone, scoring points for the team. So to get rid of Cameron Bray, I just I can understand it as far as the money side goes, but as far as the football side goes, I think that would really uh, put a little bit of a detriment on the team. Yeah, uh, quite like you said earlier, the availability of OJ Howard. He got to stay healthy. You got to stay healthy, bud. We need you. Here's a good one. Gage Malone. Do you trade one if the trade comes in, the right trade comes in? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm no. going to go with a no. Um, again, production is there. Talent mm-hmm. is there. You want to take another chance on somebody you don't know about? You clearly saw that quarterbacks aren't really what they, they think they are unless you really have nobody there as mm-hmm. they keep on falling. Except, you know, except for Daniel Jones. And like I said, those are teams that absolutely had to have a quarterback. They got the guy they want. Um, and he's third in total yards and 12th in scoring, and you're 25 years old. That's way too early to be giving up on a quarterback. I just just saying. Um, but honestly, who who's going to trade for Winston right now? I mean, uh, teams all have their quarterbacks. I mean, and they just really draft. Give up a lot. Yeah. They said – Oh, so that jumped up. People are commenting like crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, all right, hold on, hold on, guys, hold on. Tristan, you slid in there, you little slickster. Break <laughs> no J numbers were almost identical the last few years. Depth picking again, depth picking again at its finest. But well, well, um, Bray wasn't a draft pick. He was he was undrafted, and we let him go and brought him back, and then um, he played well. Um, for us, and they got a second contract, which is seven million or six and a half or whatever it is. I mean, he played well. Jerry says, Bill, Winston's not going anywhere. Uh, what Keith, if he isn't good enough to play here, then what trade value does he have? Very good point. Oh, is he talking about Bray? No, he's talking about Winston. He's talking about you want to trade Winston. If he has no trade value here, then who's going to trade for him? I think, I think he made that point earlier. And somebody, what are the one I wanted to click on for like a hundred messages? This game, <laughs> um, uh, somebody said, get rid of McCoy and pick up Ziggy Ansa. I, I wouldn't I, be upset. I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Can Ziggy play in this new system? I, the one gap, he's really an in. I don't know if he's really was asked to play inside at all. I don't know. That's interesting. That yeah. that's that's an interesting one. I'm, I'm gonna look into that one. See what it what outside really can do. Yeah. Has to play inside. I, I know he's a. I think he's Haitian, right? He's Haitian. So yeah. I, know he didn't play, I think he was like a lot like Jason Pierre Paul. Didn't play a whole lot of football growing up, and then got in. And you know, once starting to play, starting to play football, he came out well, and you know, made a name for himself. But and, you know, that's interesting. I'm gonna look into that. Tristan, I, everybody keeps saying that about Bray to New England. Great doesn't feel what New England lights unless they're going to run the type of Aaron Hernandez, uh, Gronkowski type thing. But he can't run block to save his life. He can only he can only catch passes, and that's and why he's not as big as Gronkowski either. Yeah, right? and, and Austin Safarian Jenkins, Jenkins was literally the best pick uh, that they could pick up because he can run, he can he can block, and he can catch passes very well. So mm-hmm. I think he's going to pretty much make a very good name for himself, or he's going to feel. Um, uh, the old tight end that he just got rid of slips my mind. It happened so much thing about everything. But anyway, you just you just serve purpose to block. That's pretty yep. much it. Well, so we'll see what happens. Um 
the trade, the Winston trade narrative implodes upon itself because of the logic. Oh, that's the key. Some of the Winston trade. Ziggy got three, three, three fourths of his sacks in two games. I don't really care. To be honest, I really don't care about sack numbers. I care about production and pressure. That's how you win. It's not all just about sacks. That's we got to get out of that habit. Just talking about well, how many sacks did he put up? Oh, how many sacks did he create for somebody else? Exactly. Or well, how many points did they allow that offense to put up? I mean, that's really what it all boils down to. Who has more points at the end of the game? What defensive lineman helped prevent that team from scoring points? I'm gonna tell you right now. Part predominantly, and I hit. Carl Nassib sacks right on the head. I think he had seven. Then I, I think I said that, but in the article, he's going to get seven sacks. And that's exactly what he got. Um, Lisa Dorr says, Golston, um, the three players, Golston, Smith, and Dotson. But we Dot- didn't pick an offensive lineman. Otherwise, I'd be with it. Yeah. That's what I say. We got to keep Dotson. Mm-hmm. We, we, we have to keep him. He had such a great 2017 season. I mean, he would have made the Pro Bowl if he didn't get hurt uh, towards the end of the season. He, I, I think he was rated as the top offensive lineman almost for all of 2017 until he got injured. Right. I mean, he has it in it. He, you know he has it in it. He's done it before. It's just he's getting older, man. They they need to find a replacement for him and fast. Yep. It, it, that's, and that's the thing. You let him go to save salary cap, but then you're shooting yourself in the other foot because you don't have any replacement. You don't know what you, you know, and that's the right side of the line. I think you said earlier, you need to fortify your words. Say you need to fortify the right side of the line. You're going to defortify that by letting him go. As now you, you're butt naked at guard, and now you're butt naked at right tackle. I mean, which is pretty much going to have to snap the ball and look to see who's coming and see who you want to get hit by first before you let <laughs> the receivers run down the field. Have you ever guys ever heard of a lookout block? I'm gonna tell you what the lookout <laughs> block is. It's where the defense, it's where the offensive lineman whiffs on the block and looks back and yells, "Look out!" That's called a lookout block. <laughs> oh man, that's good. <laughs> Don't try to steal it. Punchline. Uh, I, have, I have it recorded, so I can't promise it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's some good stuff on these boys. Is going off in here. He is too old. Knees won't last. I, I'm Misa Dora. I usually I love your post. Let me just say that. But who are you gonna replace them with? Oh, we didn't drop any linemen. Unless you plan on putting defensive linemen at Dackle. And I'd be interested to see that. Yeah, we have no replacements. We literally watched ourselves on the offensive line. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I'm not disagreeing with your point, period. Just who's the replacement? That's when people say all this stuff about da 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 da. Okay, who's coming in? Give me give me a reason who's coming in. I'll agree with you. Yep. Oh, this is a good one. Jay Hughes coming back. He's on fire tonight. Can't you can't give up on Dotson getting old with injuries, but he has the skill. Not to mention, we need a better right guard. Is Kappa the answer? Well, Kappa isn't the answer. I understand not drafting O line in a weak O line draft. Ryan Jensen also wasn't the player I thought he would be for us coming from Baltimore. Hopefully. He looks better this year. And I think Ryan Jensen did benefit a lot from the other offensive linemen around him, which and so too. that's why offensive linemen working together is important. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's he, my biggest thing with Ryan Jensen is he's got to cut down on the stupid penalties, the getting a, too aggressive when he moves down the field, not paying attention to what's going on with the play that's actually going on mm-hmm. at the time. And I think that hurt them a lot, especially a lot of those Peyton Barber runs. You know, you guys, are, you know, everybody wants to hate on the run game for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, but how many how many of those explosive runs did Barber have for twenty or thirty yards got called back because of an offensive line yeah. penalty, because a wide receiver putting hands where he shouldn't have? You have the the guy to run the workload for the team. You just have to get the guys blocking for him on the same page and not doing dumb stuff. Yep. I agree. Um, Tristan Gay says, but I do pay attention to numbers. For example, in Vea guy played 13 games and his impact can't, can't be traced. It can be traced to two games. He almost had two sacks against Dallas, arguably one of the best offensive lines in the league. He sacked Dak Prescott and the other, it was a face mask call. So if he can do that against the best offensive line in the league, I think he could play against those guys. And we all agree there's some pretty studs on that team. Um, and he missed a, quite a couple just because he's not athletic enough to you know chase down the quarterback he was chasing or he wasn't fast enough. He's getting it there. Like you just can't put everything on sacks. Stop yeah. doing that. Putting everything on sacks. Call him a bus. Da 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 da. You got to remember he didn't 
he didn't participate in anything in off season because that the injury, which I'm glad he got it passed and he was able to play. And then by the end of the season, he was at mid season form because he hadn't played. Yep. So that's why he started looking real good near the end of the season. And, and he's not a sack guy. You knew that when he was drafted coming out of Washington. He's not a guy that that that's a sack guy. He's a he's an interior run clogger that's going to demand two blocks. And if he's in one on one, he's going to beat the guy in front of him. That's the kind of guy he is. And that's what an interior lineman's job is: is to create havoc. That's their job. They can get sacks, great, but that's not what they're only measured on. I mean, you can have a guy that that just gets sacks and then gets pushed out the way and run support. He does both. And 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 I think if Carl Nassib was sitting in this room with, with me right now, he would agree and say, I got a lot of sacks off of Via Vea pushing the guard into the quarterback's lap, and the quarterback ran right into my lap, and I got a sack. I promise you he'll tell me that. And if I've seen him, I'll make sure I get it on video, and he'll tell me that. Because it's the truth. Yeah, no, it is. It's the it's truth. It's unit, it. like the offensive line. You know, it's you block it. guys. Yeah. You open up this gap, and now your running back makes plays. Same thing on the defensive line. Get these two blocks out of the way. This guy can cover the outside in case he runs out. Have that quarterback. I mean, it's it all works together. It gels together. It's like chess. Football is like chess. It, everything's got to work together. You got to understand the moves ahead of time. Right. I'm going with some of the comments that are flowing in, man. Uh-oh, got barber questions. Yeah, we didn't really talk about barber. I'm glad somebody brought it up. Misa Dora always brings it, boy. I got to get him on one of these. Uh, barber averaging. Oh, hold on, Barber. Barber averaging three yards a carry, but averaging two point five out of the contact. That tells you he was he was being hit in the backfield. That's impressive. Thank you. That, that's true. Someone understands it. <laughs> Someone understands it. It's not him. He's fine in the holes when they're there, yeah. but you usually got to break a tackle uh, to to get the yards. Kind of like Barry Sanders back in the day. You had to break two tackles to gain five. Because the people were in the backfield, literally almost taking the hand off the same time as you were. <laughs> um, That's what happened to Ronald Jones this past year too. He oh got hit. He just, I think he just needs to focus. I th- it's a lot with him. I think it's a, the neck up. It's a neck yeah. up issue. The skills are fine. Neck down. It's the neck up. Mm-hmm. Misador again. Vea is a beast. He forced the pocket and and th- and thus rolls. To the end, in one side of the I, I get what you're saying. You make me right. forcing the quarterback to move, and that's why Carl Nassar, especially the Browns game, I seen him twice where they had put the guard right in Baker Mayfield's lap, and Nassar was there to clean up, which I'm happy for him because he got to play against his former team and got two sacks that game. Um, uh, the, the Greg Schiano of centers. Oh, wow, let's not bring up Greg Schiano, <laughs> please. He's um, taking great for his family. No, Lord. He said the whole. He said the guy that might disagree. I think he's talking about when I was comparing it to him. I've been just saying they're both um, the same kind of player to me. Finding the holes, no worries. We've drafted some reinforcements on the O line. No, we didn't. We didn't draft any reinforcements on the O line. Nobody. Oh, uh, literally none. Unless the corners are playing O line. Um, they didn't run a four three Tampa two every every goddamn play like White Smith did. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's playing Ben don't break defense. I think that it is, but it was more break than Ben, if you get what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what defense did uh what defense did they run in Baltimore? And how was he in Detroit? Are you talking are you talking about Asa? Oh, are you, or no, are you talking about Nagata. Okay, I get you, Tristan. I get you, I get you, I get you, I get you. Yeah, got and the guy that played the end, and they played on. He played on the same side as Terrell Suggs, and we all know how that went. They both were eating, especially Suggs was getting a lot of sacks uh, around that time. And I, I, I think they're probably asking him to play three technique in Detroit. I'm not sure. I didn't pay too much attention to him um, in Detroit, but um, he definitely wasn't the same kind of player. Again, he was 30 when he left. So, um, right. his tackle numbers are in reference. Oh, he's talking about Tristan. He said, no, his tackle numbers are my reference. Vey is, is a power pig who draft who drafts a power pig that high. Like, come on. <clears throat> I get what you're saying. An interior lineman. I mean, you're last in the league in the sacks and last in the league at that season at that point. And um you got you kind of gotta draft a defensive lineman. I don't think yeah. there were any ends on the board that I can remember now. I probably might be missing somebody. I'm sure you guys will throw it out in my face later, which I'm fine with being wrong every now and then. 
Um, but you kind of draft, draft a defensive lineman when you're last in the league in sacks. I know that you guys wanted Derwin James, but what was the point of having Derwin James if you can't cover if you can't get to the quarterback? Yeah, <laughs> there is none. Exactly. What's he gonna do back there? Now, granted, you can come back again and counterpoint me. Well, well, if we had him this year and we fixed the offensive line, the defensive line, then he could have played well under Todd Bowles system. Who knows? You could play the what if game. Who knows? If Todd Bowles and Bruce Aarons would have came this year if we if if we drafted him. We don't know. <laughs> oh, uh, I think that's it. I think we got pretty good. Somebody mentions uh Jensen and the penalties. We got into that. Highest paid center, not to me. Yeah. Um well, he, excuse me. He is a high paid center. He's not playing to, like at the level of a highest paid center. Okay, yeah. Um, I'll bring up this one real quick, and this will be my last one. Yeah. Uh, Tristan again hitting us up. The issue with the team is player development and drafting guys one year and then replacements the next is foolish. And we kind of got into that, um, which brings me to you know kind of what Clifton Smith was saying when we were interviewing him. Um, you got to develop the players you have. You can't turn the roster over every single season. Yep. You're not going to win anything like that. You're going to have new guys in here every single year, and that's just the re- recipe for disaster right there. I agree wholeheartedly. You can't. You got to have some type of continuity, but Bruce Aaron makes a good point. You got to have accountability. You got to have both. Well, I think that will wrap that up now, Phil. I appreciate you coming on now, talking about the draft process, even though we spent the draft together too, which is cool. <laughs> I know Peter and me and him had a little divorce right now. We're separated right now. He did his own draft thing. I did mine. So we're kind of at a divorce right now. So I brought in uh, the ringer, Phil. He came That's through right. in the clutch, as he always does, coming out of Red Flag Podcast, full-time student, chef on the side, doing everything. So these guys at Buckle Support, man, we put in the hard work, man, and, and we work our own lives, and, and we try to – I don't get on as much as I used to, and I should writing and stuff like that. It's just, man, it's just life catches up with you. But yeah. – uh, I appreciate everybody, Phil. Thanks for coming on. And we will catch you guys next time on Buck's Report.